Hello everyone, welcome to A Fistful of Dice. My name is Matt, and today we're going to be diving into a new episode of Monster Matters, the YouTube show where we take a monster from a tabletop RPG, talk about it at length, go over its origins, and also discuss different fun and unique and challenging ways that you can use these monsters in your next tabletop RPG game. So, today we're going to be talking about Undead, the Undying Horde. Undead are one of the most widespread, dynamic, and versatile uh, creature types in games like D&D. There's so many different kinds of undead that all operate in completely different ways, and so it's actually been a little daunting uh, trying to break down undead in a very, you know, quick, simple, easily digestible sort of manner, but I think I've done an okay job, and I hope that you find some inspiration in this video. Again, as I say with all episodes of Monster Matters, this is merely my interpretation of the monsters, looking at them from a RPG perspective. You should use this video as a way to inspire your own ideas, and, you know, really delve into the, uh, the source material, the origins of these monsters, to find your own unique take on undead and how they work. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. So, Undead 101, let's go over the basics. What constitutes an undead creature? Typically, an undead creature is something that was once alive. Um, usually, they have been returned to animate life uh, through either supernatural or spiritual forces. And so this is a creature that has died but has now returned to life, right? So we're th talking things like zombies, skeletons, vampires, ghosts, things like that. Uh, typically, there are two different ways uh, to create an undead creature. There's necromancy and then spiritual means, right? And so necromancy can be things like... Um, uh, like a lich, right? A lich requires a very uh, in-depth, sort of complicated ritual in order to make oneself a lich. Likewise, there's rituals and spells involved with raising skeletons and zombies and things like that. If you look at something uh, that's a more spiritual take, it's normally unintentional, right? You have things coming back uh, from the afterlife because they need to uh, get revenge or they have unfinished business or um, there was a lot of pain and suffering involved with their passing. Um, in uh, games like D&D, you might also see areas that are latent with negative energy um, that uh, give rise to naturally occurring undead. Uh, you know, you might have a swamp um, that is just, uh, you know, if you look at like a Lord of the Rings, you know, you have the, the swamp with the uh, dead elves and men floating in the water, right? That's sort of an example of like an area of intense negative energy where the undead sort of just naturally occur. Um, there's also typically two different kinds of undead. There's incorporeal, things like ghosts, wraiths, things that uh, don't necessarily exist physically on our plane of existence, and then corporeal, things like zombies, vampires, skeletons. But you will also see kinds of undead that can shift between the corporeal and the, and the incorporeal. Undead, by and large, are generally considered evil. You know, they are the, there is no real uh, good way to bring someone back from the dead in D and D. Um, obviously, you know, uh, exceptions exist to this rule, and uh, you know, you will see things like uh, good-aligned ghosts, vampires, um, sapient zombies that really just kind of want to keep to themselves. You know, things like that. Um, Typically, undead are shunned by society, uh, thought of as evil, vile, violent, and, uh, you know, they've kind of uh, have this reputation, but for a good reason. They're incredibly dangerous creatures uh, for the most part. Um, mechanically, immune, uh, uh, undead creatures are immune to a lot of different com conditions and ailments. Uh, typically, they don't need to uh, eat or sleep or breathe. Um, certain uh, damage types don't really do anything to them. You know, uh, uh, classically, skeletons um, are resistant at least to slashing and piercing damage, and you need to do bludgeoning damage to do real damage to them because, you know, they don't have any flesh or vital organs that you can pierce and puncture. You just have to smash their bones. Um, undead have a lot of these different immunities and resistances, which makes them... Um, 
pretty tough foes, even at low levels. You know, throwing a zombie or a skeleton at a low level party will typically uh, be a little bit of a tougher fight than, say, a goblin, just because of those immunities and resistances and the fact that um, sometimes a lot of spells, especially mind-altering spells, don't really do much against them and don't work. And like I said earlier, uh, most of the time they do not need to eat, breathe, sleep, anything like that. They don't need normal functions required to live because, again, they're not really living. Something I like to do in Monster Matters is go into the origins of these monsters and talk about where they come from in folklore, mythology, things like that, and um, try to eke as much inspiration as we can from those origins. And so undead are like, I mean, they've been around since time immemorial. You know, some version of undead creature exists in almost every culture in the world. Um, I think that you know, humans are naturally sort of afraid of death. They fear death, dead things. And so uh, that fear manifests itself in the stories and the folklore that we hear from, you know, cultures across the globe. Um, just some some examples here. Uh, this is merely a handful of examples. In Haitian folklore, you have zombies that are corpses animated by magic, right? And so that's sort of like that, the voodoo idea that zombies are created through magic. Um, in Norse mythology, uh, there are things called draugr, who are undead warriors who guard their graves. So if you break into a tomb, uh, you know, the warriors will rise to guard their resting places. Um, an interesting example in Chinese folklore, there's something called a zhang shi, uh, which are spirit vampires. Uh, that instead of draining their victims of their blood, they uh, drain their spirit, their soul, their life force. And what's most terrifying about them is they, they don't fly like a typical vampire, but they leap around, which is almost a little creepier. And then you have something like in Irish mythology, uh, the Banshee, you know, that's where the Banshee comes from, uh, mournful female spirits. Um, who you can hear sort of wailing on the wind when uh, death is on the horizon. And so they're, they, you know, that's sort of a, a superstition of uh, an undead creature. Now we go into more modern times, um, and you see undead in books, movies, uh, just across uh, media of all kinds. Um, some uh, pretty seminal works that a lot of undead creatures are sort of based around. Uh, obviously, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein uh, has a lot to do. Uh, modern sort of influences on zombies and things like flesh golems are really informed by Frankenstein. Um, and then you have uh, like The Mummy, The Death of Halpin Frazier, both, you know, uh, creatures returning from the afterlife. Obviously, Dracula from 1897 uh, pretty much uh, set the stage for vampires and sort of established how vampires work and the different superstitions involved with them. Edgar Allan Poe has several works that include uh, undead creatures or things returning from the afterlife. Even something like the Telltale Heart has sort of those um, trappings of an undead creature, right? So the vengeful spirit returning from the afterlife. And then obviously you have things like H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, who use undead creatures throughout their works. Um, there's also the horror cinema of the early 20th century, and then you go on to have people like George A. Romero and John Comp Carpenter use things like zombies and other undead creatures extensively in their movies. And, um, and now even today, you know, you have shows like The Walking Dead, which, um, you know, is sort of, and World War Z, you know, is a book and then a movie. Um, undead are prevalent in our society. We're sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I hesitate to use the word obsessed, but um, just... <laughs> They appear so predominantly in different movies and TV shows that um, it is a big facet of uh, at least Western culture to have undead creatures featured as a uh, as a primary antagonist. So, I always try to break down these creature types into easily digestible sort of uh, subtypes, right? With undead, I've broken it down thusly: subservient, autonomous, superior, and vengeful. Let's go through those. Subservient undead do what they're told. So this is things like zombies and skeletons. Obviously, exceptions exist to these rules, but this is just basic scratching the surface examples, right? So subservient undead is something that, you know, an evil wizard would have, uh, a, a noble lord would have guarding their tomb, you know, things like that. They're, they're not really self-aware. They're not sapient, um, but they follow orders and sort of just are driven by, uh, you know, a command or some sort of... Uh, uh, urge from uh, beyond. 
Then you have autonomous undead who do what they need. You have things like revenants and ghouls. Revenants are sapient undead who have some sort of unfinished business or vengeance that they need to acquire. And then you have ghouls who are fully aware but are driven by their need um, uh, to feed, right? Then there are superior uh, undead who do what they want. Liches and vampires, they are fully aware, fully sapient, usually have followers, right? So you'll have uh, liches who have undead armies, vampires who are uh, who have some sort of uh, coven or harem of followers uh, along with them. And then you have vengeful undead who do what they feel. These are creatures of raw emotion and urges, things like banshees and morgues who are... Uh, you know, sort of this idea of the insatiable appetite. You know, they have they have some sort of task that they need to complete. It's in their nature rather than what they need or want to do. It's just, it is a part of them. So let's go a little bit more in depth. Subservient undead are usually um, either created through magic or summoned and then later controlled by a greater power. You know, like I mentioned before, uh, an evil wizard or a superior and dead, something like a lich or a vampire. Um, it includes things like skeletons, zombies, lesser undead uh, like that, who have no true sort of self-awareness or will of their own. They're uh, typically seen serving as guardians, warriors, um, you know, sort of frontline grunt troops in an undead horde. Or like I mentioned before, you know, you bust into a tomb, the first thing you encounter is, you know, some sort of zombie or skeleton sort of guarding the place. Um, generally, mechanically, l looking at the rules of the game, uh, a single skeleton, a single zombie isn't going to pose a great threat to even a low-level party, but once you get them into a group um, where they're supporting each other, flanking the party, utilizing terrain, things like that, they can be uh, deadly. So uh, whenever you're using subservient undead, think about ways to up the ante with them, whether you're using environmental hazards, terrain, um, or just using them smartly in groups, uh, supporting each other, covering each other, things like that. Autonomous undead. Um, this is an interesting subset of undead. I, I've really been sort of enjoying playing around with this idea uh, lately. Um, autonomous undead can be summoned, created, or even naturally occurring, right? So they can just sort of naturally occur through nature, negative energy, things like that. Um, some examples of autonomous undead are revenants, bodax, gas, and animuses. Um, they are fully in control of themselves. They possess an individual will and even intelligence. Um, they can uh, sort of uh, choose where they want to go and what they want to do. Um, they will sometimes serve a master or exist in groups. You know, if you're a creature, something like a revenant, right? Uh, or even ghouls, you know, will band together in tribes um, to sort of look out for each other and protect each other because there's no way that, it, you know, a lone revenant is really going to walk into a town and find a safe place to live or people that want it around. Um, some of them have a hunger or a need that must be sated, obviously, looking at things like ghouls and ghasts in particular that always need to feed, um, or a revenant that is driven by a vengeful need to complete something or unfinished business uh, that they need to do in order to pass on and find peace in the afterlife. Um, I like Autonomous Undead because they have those sort of mechanical immunities, those damage resistances, condition immunities that make undead such um, uh, tough uh, challenges, but you also add in that sort of uh, human-like cunning, that intelligence, that self-awareness, and uh, you create a very, um, a very real threat to the player characters. Uh, autonomous undead are not to be trifled with, for sure. Then you have superior undead. Um, this is, you know, obviously you think of liches <coughs> uh, most uh, readily um, when you think of uh, superior undead. They are most of the time created through magic rituals, you know, whether it's a, um, a vampire uh, uh, creating another vampire through their rituals, a lich creating itself through the uh, creation of a phylactery and the tearing of their soul <clears throat> and placing it within the phylactery. Um, other examples of superior undead include Bailnorn, Death Knights, and Dracoliches. Dracoliches, which are uh, dragons that have completed a lich ritual, and they are one of the, you know, most uh, uh, dangerous undead uh, in tabletop RPGs. There's also, you know, undead, uh, like, lich beholders that are incredibly dangerous as well. Um, superior undead, you know, they they go into undeath with the same sort of intellect 
and power that they had in life bolstered by uh, limitless time. They are immortal creatures uh, by and large, and so they have the time to um, pursue skills, pursue research, gain new spells and power and uh you know if you if you are a creature like a lich in particular which is you know often a voluntary process if you are willing to sacrifice your humanity to gain immortality and magical power obviously you are going to be a very ambitious and driven individual and you're going to continue gaining new power skills and spells throughout your undeath um Superior undead are unique in that they will almost always have followers of some kind. Um, you know, they will have uh, subservient and autonomous undead serving them uh, as foot soldiers, as guardians. Um, you know, sometimes they will have vast undead hordes at their command, which is when they pose the greatest threat, I think, to um, mortal life. Um, superior undead are probably the greatest of the undead creatures. Um, in terms of power and skill and intellect. Uh, they're typically capable of powerful magic and spell-like abilities, and it's really tough to permanently kill them. There's normally something very specific involved with killing them permanently, whether it's you know stabbing a vampire through the heart with a stake or um, destroying the phylactery of a lich or a dracolich. Now, let's talk about vengeful undead, the last type of undead. This is sort of unique. Um, Vengeful Undead uh, um, sort of uh, inspired a lot by folklore and how they work and uh, what they look like, how they act, their methods, and things like that. Um, vengeful Undead are typically the result of great suffering, evil, or negative energy. Like I mentioned before, you know, if you think about uh, the, uh, the the dead marshes in Middle Earth, you know, those are uh, creatures sort of created through great suffering and uh, latent negative energy. They're existing as these like wraith-like forms within the water. Uh, some examples of vengeful undead include banshees, morgues, and specters. They're normally driven by an insatiable innate need, uh, you know, to scare people, harm them, murder, uh, feed, things like that. They are creatures, like I mentioned before, of just raw emotion. There's, there's no real... Um, intellect there's no real wisdom or singular will there they are driven by a need that consumes them uh, they are most often solitary creatures it's pretty rare that you'll see creatures like these band together or work together um, they have very very little memory if anything of their former lives and the longer they exist as an undead creature the less and less they remember of their former selves and their former lives uh, they are just tortured souls uh, who only want to spread their misery to others. They are uh, misery and pain incarnate, um, which makes them pretty terrifying creatures. They're greatly feared uh, for their malice um, and their just their need to spread hate and violence and terror. So, how are some ways that we can use undead? Um, like I mentioned earlier in this episode, undead are incredibly adaptable. They can fit in just about any setting, any terrain, um, any story. There's so many different kinds of undead creatures and different types um, that they really work in just about any sort of situation. And there's lots of variety there for you to use. Um, you know, if you look at a, a setting like Ravenloft, there's so much undead uh, in Ravenloft, but it doesn't feel stale or samey just because there's so many different types. You know, you have the zombies, you have the revenants, you have the vampires, and they and, and the, the death knights, you know, and they all sort of play off of each other and create this really interesting uh, culture um, with their differences and also their similarities. Uh, you can use undead as lone threats. You know, you walk into a tomb, there's a couple skeletons there. Uh, tireless guardians, you know, what if you had a... Um, uh, like a revenant guarding a tomb and uh, once the PC steals something from the tomb the revenant pursues them across the land that would be kind of cool or even shambling hordes you know you have that that uh, stereotypical sort of undead army you know marching ceaselessly it does not require food or water or sleep it just marches and burns and kills as it goes 
Um, the motivations of creatures, undead creatures, are oftentimes pretty clear and simple, which makes them easy for a dungeon master to utilize. You know, if you have a ghoul, the ghoul needs to eat. Vampires, they need to feed. Uh, liches want to acquire more power, more spells, more followers, things like that. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to come up with a motivation for these creatures. But then, that also um, sort of allows you to play against those ideas. You know, if you have a ghoul that doesn't want to eat and has some sort of other motivation, that creates an interesting situation situation that your players may not be expecting and so it's it's kind of good to play upon those tropes but also to um so sometimes intentionally break the rules to create an interesting situation that you uh that you can kind of play up undead creatures also present the dungeon master with an opportunity to play up dark horror in a campaign you know they're a very easy way <clears throat> to present um uh, fright and horror uh, darkness, sort of grim aspects into a campaign that doesn't necessarily have them. At the same time, though, undead are so versatile that you can you can have campy undead. You know, you can have a Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, zombified rising out of a tar pit and have that sort of be, you know, ca uh, more of a campy flavor with that, you know, B-movie. Um, you can go super horror with it um, and have zombies, you know, uh, eating peasants and turning them into into uh, other zombies and things like that. So there are lots of different ways that you can utilize them to achieve different tones in your campaign. Um, and at the same time, uh, undead are pretty miserable creatures. You know, you you can't help but feel a bit of sympathy to undead, especially ones that are aware of themselves, who are sapient, uh, who know full well what they are and uh, what they're capable of. And that can create some opportunities for character development and sympathetic characters. So I always like to um, leave the viewer with some ideas of how to use uh, these creatures. And so uh, with Undead, um, I have a few different examples for you here of adventure hooks, um, encounter ideas that you can just kind of take and run with and use in your next game. So Loyal Beyond Death. The PCs delve into the tomb of the long dead Lord Arum Belford, said to be said to have been buried with his riches. Arum in life was a cruel and greedy skinflint, and had his house guards sealed within the tomb to protect his fortune. As the PCs enter the tomb, the animated skeletons of Lord Arum Belford's guards rise with weapons in hand to solacely defend their late lord's fortune, while Arum himself rises from the dead, bedecked in golden armor. So that's a really simple encounter idea that you can use, um, but kind of an interesting twist where these creatures were not, uh, you know, put here because they wanted to be or anything like that. They're literally, you know, serving their noble lord even beyond their deaths. The Undead Barkeep. The PCs arrive in the small backwoods village of Duskmire. Tired and in need of supplies, they head for the local tavern and general store, the Sodden Noose. To their surprise, they find a decaying corpse behind the bar, talking with the patrons as if nothing is amiss. If the PCs react harshly, the townspeople jump to the barkeep's aid, saying, Moldy's been nothing but a blessing to the town of Duskmire. He's as good and tireless a worker as we've ever seen. Moldy is apparently a revenant, though he cannot seem to recall his unfinished business. So this is, you know, like I mentioned earlier, taking the idea of the sympathetic undead, taking a character, um, you know, who has obviously experienced great pain and leads a life uh, very unlike a normal person, and uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, playing upon that that sort of innate sympathy that the player characters will feel for for them. Um, here, you know, is an, is a situation that's ripe for. Um, uh, quests. If the PCs want to help him try and finish his unfinished business, um, he can become a quest giver for the PCs. He can become a very beloved NPC for sure. Now, here's a little treat. I reached out to some people, uh, some of my good friends here in the YouTube RPG community, and asked if they would be willing to create scenarios for you guys using undead creatures. And a few of them jumped at the chance, so they supplied some pretty cool ideas for you guys, so I hope you enjoy. Here's one from Barker from Be A Better Game Master entitled The Dying Reaches. A group of vampires have ostracized themselves from their undead societies, choosing to travel into the trackless tundra, into a life of isolation, painful discomfort, and inevitable death after decades of starvation. They choose this life of self-sacrifice in lieu of a monstrous existence, wholly spent feeding on the living. But when a northern borderland town experiences a series of murders, bloodletting, many of the townsfolk begin to question the fasting ways of the nearby vampire colony. Something must be done to quell the mob. 
So that's another interesting situation of somewhat sympathetic undead vampires who have chosen to go against their um, their nature and uh, have removed themselves from the uh, from the mainland uh, in an attempt to remove the need or the uh, you know the sort of uh, innate want to feed and harm people. So. That could definitely be an interesting situation. Uh, you know, maybe you find out that the vampires are not as nice as they seem, uh, you know, and they're feeding on people, or maybe it's the towns pe- townsfolk who are uh, who are to blame, and there's you know a regular human man uh, in who is uh, at fault for the killings. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you could take that. Here's one from Tim and James from Tabletop Terrors. This has to do with their homebrew world of Dragon Grin. This is entitled The Seric of Dragon Grin. In the unforgiving and expansive sphere mountains of Dragongrin, the Seric live in secret, secretive colonies amidst the myriad malevolent undead that plague the region. These sapient pseudo-undead creatures, skeletal in their appearance, have an insatiable hunger of a unique kind indeed. They must feed on magic or they will die. There is one foul short reprieve from this hunger, eating other Seric. The Seric appear to be good-natured and the rumors of who leads them is farcical a virtuous lich fighting to make reparations for his transgressions during Lightfall. So this is a very interesting, unique take on Undead. Taking Undead, making them a player race, right? A playable race uh, by the PCs, and creating a an almost vampire-like quality where they must feed on magic um, in order to uh, persist. Uh, and I do like the idea, too, of the lich attempting to make reparations um, for uh, for his transgressions during Lightfall. Lightfall being uh, the war that saw evil triumph over good. Um, that's definitely a, a different, uh, unique, and kind of fun idea to play with. And finally, we have something from Nate over at WASD20. This one is entitled The Swamp Things. Decades ago, a rebel group of high elves were banished from their homeland and made the journey across the West Reach Sea to an uninhabited island. All seemed well in their new home, and they began to build a settlement worthy of their noble race. Lately, however, their dead had been resisting the finality of the grave, and the horrifying sight of their decaying corpses can be seen loping about the island. A druid has traced the source of the decay to dark magic under the surface of the swamp in the middle of the island. In the past week, small children claim they sighted a massive rotting beast rising from the surface of the swamp. I love this. I love the idea of elf zombies, right? What would an elf zombie look like or act like? Would they be different than a human zombie? I, I, I think so. Um, I think they'd be more sort of nature-based. Um, I picture them sort of being uh, covered in moss and plants and things like that. And the idea of some sort of massive undead beast being the source of the malady is really interesting. What kind of creature is it? Is it, a, is it a, an undead frog hemoth, maybe? <laughs> I think that might be kind of cool. So to, um, to end our uh, episode here of Monster Matters, I'd like to just throw some cool ways to use Undead in your game at you, and maybe you'll get some inspiration from this and some ideas for your next session of D&D or any RPG that you might be playing. A zombie dinosaur mounted by skeleton archers. That's an idea that we came up with on the uh, Roll Up and Die podcast. A half-finished lich. He botched the ritual and is now a rotting half-undead monstrosity. Um, that is a non-player character that I used in uh, the Sundered Throne uh, games on my channel. Undead goblins, orcs, ogres, use your imagination. I have a uh, Magic the Gathering deck that is a zombie goblin deck that um, creates undead goblins, and I've always thought it'd be kind of cool to play around with that in Dungeons & Dragons as well. Undead player characters. We just saw um, a version of this with the Seric of Dragongrin thinking about um, allowing your players to play undead creatures. There are rules in 5th edition for creating a revenant character within the Ravenloft setting. Uh, maybe look at that for inspiration. Uh, what about using a vampire who feeds on spirit and life rather than blood? Sort of similar to the Chinese Shang-Chi, which we had discussed earlier in the episode. Uh, how about taking the lich in a different direction? Have a wizard's preserved head in a jar, and he uses constructs to continue his research, directing them as a disembodied presence. I really like that idea of uh, a less sort of intimidating, less uh, scary lich, a wizard who exists just as a head floating around in a jar, sort of Futurama style. Or how about we take it in a different direction? We do nature-based plant zombies, similar to what I just discussed with Nate's idea with the elf zombies. Uh, Creatures who are reanimated with vines and fungi rather than uh, dark magic or negative energy. 
I hope you guys have enjoyed this latest episode of Monster Matters. Uh, I know these episodes come few and far between, but I really do enjoy making them. And uh, I hope that you found some inspiration here. You've learned a little bit about Undead, their origins, and how you can use them in your tabletop RPG game. Thank you all again for tuning in and watching. Appreciate the support. As always, take care and happy gaming all.